just going to leave it at that. I'll just leave it with that last answer. We won't even bother preaching today. We're all good. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. And uh, verse 14, we're going to be quickly in the passage that uh, Tammy read for us this morning. Uh, You might also want to flip over to John chapter 14. We're going to be bouncing around a little bit this morning. We are in the second week of Advent. That's why we've got our second candle lit. And this week we're talking about peace. Now, I have said this numerous times over the last few weeks, even into the lead up to this, to our staff and uh, to some of you who I've talked to about Advent, is that I, I just love walking through the themes of Advent. I mean, is there anybody who couldn't use a little bit more hope, a little bit more peace, a little bit more joy, a little bit more love? Like, I just think these themes that we t- touch on as we prepare our hearts for the coming of the King who brings all of those things. These are the things that our souls are longing for. In fact, I would argue to you that so much of your life, so much of my life, the decisions that we make, the things that we prioritize, the things that we do, the actions that we take, the things that we purchase or invest ourselves in, are really driven by our need to experience and to have these things, to have hope and to have joy, to have peace, to have love. If you don't believe me, you know, just watch some ads. Billions of dollars are spent trying to convince all of us that if we just had, if we would just purchase, if we just use or we just gave some other product or, or some experience, if we had that or we gave it to somebody else, that we would find the hope and the peace and the joy and the love that we're looking for. Right? Like, there's a reason Coke doesn't advertise saying, drink lots of sugar water. There's a reason instead they have a slogan at one point that said, taste happiness. Right? They know what our hearts long for. Match.com is not selling you a dating service. It's selling you the possibility that you could find real, true love. You could find your soulmate. Lotto 649 is not selling you on the odds of actually winning the lottery. Right? They are selling you on hope. Imagine the possibilities. I was just watching this week uh, one of the ads that's running right now all the time, at least uh, when I'm I'm watching sports, is uh, is a Verbo ad, vacation rental ad. That really, I think, is trying to sell us on peace. Their whole deal is the perfect getaway with just you and your people. None of that other stuff that causes you all sorts of distress, all the people that you don't want to be around, they go away and you're just with your people. You know, honestly, like, is there anyone here this morning who couldn't use a little bit more peace? Like, if you're here today and you're like, I've got all the peace I can handle, what I could really use in my life is more conflict and drama. That's what I am looking for this morning is Just fill up my life with conflict. I need more stress, more things to be worried about, more things to be fearful about. Like if that's you, you probably, you can just leave right now. You're not going to want what we're talking about this morning. But if you're sitting here today and you say, man, I could really use some peace in my life. Then this morning is for you. This is a great morning for you to be here Even if this is your very first time, man, we are so happy that you are here. This morning, I want to tell you how you can find the peace that your soul longs for. So this morning, we're going to look at what peace is, according to Scripture, what peace isn't, and where we can find the peace that our souls are longing for. Before we jump into that, let me just pray for us. Father, praying that your spirit would be in this place that the words that are spoken would be true, they would be full of hope, Father, that you would minister to our restless souls. You know, there are many people here today who have come through 
a week, a month, a season in their life where peace seems very elusive. This morning, I pray that you would bring us the peace that you came to offer through Christ, that we would discover the peace that we were made for. I ask this in the name of Jesus, who is the peace bringer. Amen. So in Luke's recording of the birth of Christ that uh, Tammy and Regan read for us, he records that as the Christ child is born, as Jesus is laid in the manger and the angels show up to declare it to the shepherds, they say and they praise out, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. Now I, I want to ask you, when you hear the word peace, what comes into your mind? What do you imagine? What do you envision? What does your soul hope for or long for? What are, you, what are you picturing your life would be like if it was more peaceful? I would argue for most of us, we think of peace in terms of absence. Right? We think of peace as an absence of something. Maybe it's an Absence of that person who drives us crazy. If we could just get them out of our life, we would have a little bit more peace. If you're with them this morning, don't point. You don't need to point. Maybe it's the absence of war, right? We turn on the news and we see, the con- we see conflict in Ukraine. Our hearts break and we say, Lord, give us the peace that you promised. Maybe the peace that you're struggling with really doesn't have anything to do with anybody It's a lack of internal peace in yourself. You are racked by anxieties and worries. You're at conflict with yourself over things. Do you know, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. In fact, instead of saying hello traditionally, a traditional Jewish greeting is shalom alechem which means peace unto you. And if I was to say shalom alechem to you, the proper response back would be alechem shalom to me, which is unto you peace. And so Jewish people will often greet each other and say peace unto you, and the person will respond unto you peace. One rabbi I was reading this week says that blessing of peace that's given in, in, the, word shalom, in the words shalom alechem means peace throughout the world and in one's personal life. It is one of the greatest blessings that anyone could give and receive. And therefore, that's why we bless each other with this blessing, because it is such a gift. Because the word shalom is not a word that just describes the absence of something. right? It, 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 it describes the presence of something. It is a feeling, an experience of, of harmony. It's, it's, the, it's the sense of completeness and wholeness. The Greek word that's used here for peace uh, in this section in Luke, Luke was writing in Greek, is erene. And, and it conveys the same type of idea. In fact, erene is where we get the English word serene from. You know, both the absence and fullness of, right? Serenity isn't just the absence of things but is a filled up sense overflowing of just at peace. Everything is right. Things are good. Biblical peace is not merely the absence of conflict, but it's a sense of completeness. So the angels are proclaiming with the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus, they're saying, peace has come. Completeness has come. Wholeness has come. And what's really interesting, you look at the life of Jesus, and the life of Jesus is bookended by this promise of peace, right? So we have the angels proclaiming peace on earth as Jesus is born. But then if we go to the final hours of Jesus' life, if we go and join up with Jesus in the upper room with his disciples, Jesus is having a conversation with them, knowing he's about to head to the cross, knowing his, his uh, life is now measured in hours, not days, and he says the following in John 14, 27, 
peace I leave you. Like if Jesus is writing a will here, he's saying, my thing that I leave my followers of all of the things I have is peace. Peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So this morning, if you are searching for peace, I'm telling you, there is no better place you could be because Jesus is saying that's exactly what he came to leave, what he came to give. And he makes this interesting statement, right? He says, not as the world gives it. That that I've got a peace that is quantitatively different than the peace that the world puts on offer through all of its advertising. So how does the peace of Jesus differ from the peace that this world offers? Well, I think it differs in at least two ways. Let me touch on those this morning. First, the peace Jesus offers is a peace that transcends circumstances. Can can we just agree that there's certain words that conjure things up in us that make us feel a certain way? Like pestule or fester or puss lynch. <laughs> That's a, we got some terribly named towns around here, don't we? Puss lynch, Burford, Guelph. They are not words that just kind of go out there and, and kind of raise your spirits. Peace is on the opposite end of that spectrum, I think. Like, I think it's just one of those words where, like, when you hear peace, there's something in the word itself that is a balm to the soul. Like, for me, when I hear peace, man, I just start to envision me and probably Amanda on a beach, (laughs) sun shining, the waves are crashing, there's warmth on my face, right? Nice breeze blowing across, never too hot, but definitely never cold. There's, there's, no, there's no work, there's no responsibilities, there's no house cleaning, there's no dishes. It, it is just like this, this perfect escape from the struggles and troubles of the world. But But Jesus says he offers a different type of peace. Because the peace Jesus offers isn't just some type of escapism. If we go two chapters over, still in the upper room with Jesus from 1427 to John 1633, he's finishing talking to them and he says, Hey, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. But he doesn't end it there. He says, In the world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter the amount of money that is in your bank account or the amount of money that isn't in your bank account. It doesn't matter how powerful you are. Doesn't matter... How many followers you have on social media. It doesn't matter how famous you are. It doesn't matter whether you're a total skeptic about everything that I'm saying this morning or you are a fully committed follower of Jesus. Can we all agree that these words are true? In this world, you will have trouble. Listen, life on the beach is wonderful. Man, I love Life on the beach. But sooner or later, no matter what beach you find yourself on, storms roll in. Winds pick up. The rain comes down. The world tries to hold out a peace that is an escape from troubles. It's circumstantial. It's just based on the realities of the moment. It's a peace that comes from earning just a little more, right? Having just enough in your retirement account. If you have saved up enough, you've got peace. It's the peace that they say, if you could just find the right person, then you'd have peace. The problem is, 
you're with the wrong person. Now, you were with the right person, but now the right person is the wrong person, so you have to find a new right person. If, if, if I could just have, right? If I could just do. If I could just be free of, or if I could just add into my life, if I could just arrange all the pieces of life and get the beach set up just right, man, then I'd have peace. Virginia Woolf, famous 20th century author, says, you cannot find peace by avoiding life. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. And you can try, and you can work, and you can do everything you want to make your life a carefree beach. But sooner or later, the storms are going to come. You can do everything that you want to insulate yourself from the world around you. You can build a little perfect bubble to keep pain and disappointment and betrayal and heartache and heartbreak and weariness and death. And that's what we do, right? Isn't that our culture? We're just doing everything we can to build a bubble to to try and keep all those things on the outside. Death terrifies us because we've moved it so far we don't ever have to see it. We put it in a back room so we're never exposed to it. We try and build this little bubble but the problem is you and I are still in the bubble and you are just as broken as all of the things that are out there that you're trying to keep out you can't fix what's wrong inside by trying to control the outside some of you I know I've shared this story before I'll share it again On our wedding day, my dad was in charge of getting the cake. He was in charge of the wedding cake. So he went down, got to the bakery, got the cake, put it in the trunk, got home, opened the trunk, went to pull the cake out of the bottom and did not realize that they had put the cake in one of those boxes that has a false bottom. And so he put his hand right up underneath and right into the top of the trunk lid. And it was panic in the house, mostly because no one wanted my mom to find out that dad had smushed the cake. So my sister started phoning around, and then she found a bakery. They couldn't fix the cake, but what they could do is they could put a whole lot of icing to just kind of build that up. Now the problem for us is that that was also gonna be part of the dessert. So they fixed up this cake with icing. My mom didn't know And we cut into it, and like some of the pieces of cake were just like three quarters icing and a little bit of smushed cake. (laughs) There's a whole lot of icing put on that cake, but it didn't, in the end, fix the cake and make it as it ought to be. Looked nice from the outside, but it was not the cake that it was supposed to be. You can't fix what's wrong on the inside by just putting a little icing on the outside. You will not find the peace your soul is longing for with just one more vacation. Why would you think the next vacation would fix what the last vacation didn't? Why would you think that the next person will fix what the last person couldn't fix in you? The peace Jesus offers is not a peace that is circumstantial. It's certainly not the type of peace that you'll find at the end of a bottle. Jesus offers to start from the inside to bring peace and then move outside. So the second thing we see about the peace Jesus offers is that the peace Jesus offers is a peace that can fight back your fears. John 14, 27, let's go back to that verse. Jesus said, the peace I leave you, my peace I give to you, not as the world uh, gives do I give it to you. Then he says this, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus wants to give you and I a peace that pushes out fear. Now fear is a reasonable and rational response to a threat. It's actually a gift that God gives us to be afraid. If you see a grizzly bear out in the woods, 
you should feel a little fear enough that it makes you run away. But fear is also an enemy of peace. Mark 4, 36 to 41, we read about a time when the disciples were faced with a storm that threatened their lives. Now these are, many of them, seasoned sailors on the boat, right? But in verse 37, it says, A great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat. So the boat was already, it was filling up with water, but he, that is Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. Disciples are overcome with fear. It totally makes sense. If your boat is filling up with water, it makes sense to have a certain amount of fear going on inside you. We were once out in Lake Erie with all of our kids. My dad was driving the boat. and If you've been out in Lake Erie, you know a storm can pick up. We were on a pontoon boat quite a far ways out, and water starts coming on the ship from the waves. And my kids are starting to get pretty nervous. It's a natural response to seeing water in a boat. Boats are supposed to sit on water. They're not supposed to have water in them. And so they say, hey, somebody's got to wake up Jesus. So it says, they woke him and said, teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? Now, I would assume Jesus cares a little bit because he's on the boat too. And he awoke and he rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, peace, be still. The wind ceased and there was a great calm and he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you so little faith? Why are you scared of a storm? Well, the answer is because we were going to die. But Jesus' point is, why are you scared of the storm when you have the one on the boat who can speak and make the storm stop? Jesus' point to them was not actually that they had no faith, it's that they had misplaced faith. They had more faith that the storm was going to pull them under than that Jesus was going to be able to save them from the storm. Fear is not a failure of faith, but it is ultimately faith in the wrong thing. If you're a follower of Jesus, you never have to live in fear. That's why Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Some of you are up against some stuff this morning. Some of you are in the boat. The water's coming in. The storm is raging. And you're up against financial challenges. You're up against relational challenges. You got health challenges going on in your life. It is natural that these things might begin to stir up some fear in us. But what Jesus would say to us is, as the fear rises, if you're with him, be at peace. Because Christ is bigger than your crisis. Your Savior, he's sovereign over any storm. Thomas Watson wrote, if God be our God, he will give us peace in trouble. When there is a storm without, he will make peace within. The world can create trouble in peace, but God can create peace in trouble. If you're, if you're searching for peace, you are overcome with worry and fear. I mean, one of the most, I think, discouraging things for me as a church leader right now is to see how fearful the church is. We're the last people that need to be fearful. Why are, we, why are we always so worried about who's going to be in power and political office? What, what the economy is going to do? Don't we have a king who is king over all things? Isn't the savior in the boat with us? We don't have to be worried. It doesn't mean we shouldn't respond with appropriate concern to things. That's not what I'm saying. But we never need to be fearful when Jesus is in the boat with us. If you're searching for peace, Jesus came to offer you a peace that transcends your circumstances, a peace that ought to push out our fear. So how do we find this peace that Jesus offers? Let me offer you three things. First, by receiving Jesus. 
John 14, 27 says, peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. The peace Jesus offers is a peace that is given, it is not earned. Peace comes through Jesus. And it's his gift to us. When the angels proclaim glory to God in the highest and on earth peace amongst those with whom he is pleased, they're saying Jesus is the source of all peace. If you want peace, you have to receive Jesus. When, when you think about it from a naturalistic lens, from like an extract God from the equation lens, it's weird that we have this feeling inside of us that peace should be the natural state of things. Because peace in our world as we've known it has never been the natural state of things. But when we think through it through a lens of scripture, scripture tells us that peace is exactly how this world was created. That God created this world in a state of shalom, in a state of completeness and wholeness and peace and goodness. And it was sin entering into the picture that destroyed and shattered the shalom of God. That's where the harmony was destroyed. That's what brought division. That's what removed serenity. It was what brought fear and anger and division and conflict and trouble. Sin put us in opposition with God and it put us in opposition with each other. Through sin, we lost the peace that God had designed us for. But the story of Scripture, the big overarching story of Scripture, is that God loved you and he loved me so much that he came to restore that peace. And Jesus is the, the way, the bridge through which we can be restored to peace with God, be taken out of a position of conflict and to be put into a right relationship with him. Isaiah 53, the prophet writes that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. On him was the chastisement, the punishment, the due judgment that what? That bought us peace. Jesus came, Jesus lived, Jesus died so that we could have peace with God. To experience peace. The peace of God, you first of all have to have peace with God. There is no peace with God unless you have experienced the peace of God. There is no peace of God unless you've experienced peace with God through Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis says, God can't give us a happiness and peace apart from himself. Because it's not there, there is no such thing. He is peace. Let's go back to John 16, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. The first step to experiencing peace is to accept that Jesus is your peace and without him there is no peace. And that leads us to the second step. We have peace by receiving Jesus and we have peace by repenting of sin. Turning to Jesus also means turning from sin. Turning away from the places that you used to go for peace. The things that used to promise you peace that you realize now, man, those don't really give the peace that my heart longs for. Now some of you are followers of Jesus right now and you say, hey, Jesus offers this peace. I, I, I've come to know Jesus. I've placed my faith in Jesus, but I've got no peace in my life. Can I suggest to you that some of you may not have peace in your life because there is unrepented sin in your life. Sin at its core puts us in conflict with God. And conflict is the absence of peace. I mean, you can't have conflict. You can't be in conflict with God and have peace. That, that's me versus God. That's what sin is. In fact, if you're at conflict with God, it would be absolutely foolish for you to be at peace. It's actually God's grace to you if you are sinning and you are in conflict with God and you are un, at unease. You are not at peace. That is a big red 
warning light saying, hey, you got some stuff that you need to take care of and God loves you enough to allow that warning light to flash. It's when that warning light stops flashing that we're really in trouble. You should not be at peace if you are at war with the person who spoke the universe into existence. That is foolishness. God is a great God. He is glorious. He is sovereign. He is holy. He is all-powerful. But I also want you to know this morning that God is good. Scripture says it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Some of you are at war with God because you understand that God is great. But I'm not sure that your hearts believe that God is good. That God actually loves you cares for you, that when he says something in his word and puts a prohibition on something, it's actually for your good. It's not just because he's capricious and arbitrary, but he actually cares about you. When it says in Luke 2.14, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, those two things go together because God's glory is not just found in his Greatness and his sovereignty and in his immensity and his power. God's glory is seen in that such a God, we sang about his holiness today, would so love us, would so care for us, that he would come as a baby and be born, that he would humble himself in such lowly circumstances because he would pursue us because we couldn't get to him. We need to receive Jesus. We need to repent of our sin. And then the third thing is this. We receive peace by remembering and resting in the promises of Jesus. What does Jesus say as he's leaving? John 16, 33, again, he says, I have said these things to you so that you may have peace. That there, are, there are promises, there are words that Jesus has said that ought to be things that give us peace. John 14, 26, just just ahead of the promise of peace, he says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Why? So that we could have peace. Now, it's really hard to remember what you've never heard. I get in, in trouble all the time at home because if the TV is on and something is said... I will not hear it, even if I kind of nod my head that I've taken it in. And so when I'm then told later, well, don't you remember that I said, the problem is I never really heard. (laughs) If you want to grow in peace, you have to get into the word of God. You have to hear the words of Jesus so that you can remember them when you need them. Here's some promises that that Jesus gives to us if we're followers of his. Matthew 28, 20, he says, we always think of this as the Great Commission. We always think of it as marching orders from Jesus. We just went through the book of Acts Ascent series. And this is our mission that we're given here. But it comes with this wonderful promise, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. If you belong to Jesus, no matter the storm that you are facing right now, Jesus is in the boat with you. John 15, 14 says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. There are some things that are in the Bible that if they weren't in the Bible, I would just have a hard time believing. This is one of those things that that God would actually call me his friend. What type of friend is he if he doesn't care about you when you're going through difficulties, if he's not there with you? He's the best type of friend. He will be there. He's there with you. He cares about you. And if Jesus is your friend, what are you worried about? Man, if the President of the United States was your friend, you probably wouldn't have a lot of concerns. Well, it depends on who the President is. He might have a lot of concerns. I don't know. (laughs) I might have concerns, but I don't know. But when you think about having the most powerful friend in the universe, why are we so worried? 
If you're living life walking in the way of Jesus, you, you never have to worry if there's something better out there than what Jesus has on offer. You know why? Because in John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, I came to give life, and it wasn't just any type of life. I actually came to give life in its fullest. The best life that you can imagine is found in Jesus. You don't have to worry about, is there some other life, some other option out there that will be better or more fulfilling to me than life with Jesus because Jesus promised us that the best life is with him. How about this one? When you go through tough stuff, you never have to wonder whether Jesus noticed it and you never have to wonder whether it was worth it. Mark 10, 29, 31 Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. When you struggle, when you suffer for Jesus, Jesus notices and he also promises that it'll be worth it. You know, one of the biggest thieves of peace is uncertainty. I think that's struggle so many have been over through the, the last few years is it's a constant feeling, sense of uncertainty, whether it was pandemic uncertainty, economic uncertainty, relational uncertainty. If you have Jesus, you don't have to be uncertain, right? You don't have to be uncertain because you actually know how the story ends. No, no matter how difficult it is right now, no matter how the circumstances look in the moment, your name's still in the story in the end. Michael Caine said when he accepts movie roles, he looks at two things. He looks to see if he's in the beginning of the script and the end of the script. And if he's in both, he takes the role. Your name is in the end of the script. Because the one that came that first Christmas is going to come again. And if you are with him, if you are in Christ, this is the promise to you. I said in Kitchener last week, I don't think there's a week that goes by that I don't go to this section of scripture. I need this for my soul so that I can have peace. Revelation 21, 1 to 5. Just, just close your eyes right now if you need to. Just listen to these words. Let Jesus speak peace to you through them. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And then I heard a, a, a loud voice from the throne saying, Look! God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away he who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. That's how the story ends for followers of Jesus. That's how your story ends. Whatever your circumstance is right now, if you're in Jesus, that's how your story ends. There is no better ending. Man, the peace Jesus brings is, is a peace our souls long for. It's not based on circumstances. It can't be taken from you. You can't lose it because it isn't tied up in any type of circumstance. It's a peace that fights back when fear inevitably comes at us. It's a peace that can push back the fear. It's a peace that is available to anyone but is found only through Jesus. A peace we can be certain in and a peace that will never disappoint. It is a peace that is rooted in the certainty that he who came, 
that very first Christmas is he who will come again. And when he came the first time, he came as a baby, lowly and meek. But when he comes the next time, he's going to come as king to restore all things to the way they were meant to be in the beginning, to the way your soul and my soul longs for, to peace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending Jesus to be our peace. And Father, if there's anyone in this room today who doesn't know Jesus, who hasn't accepted Jesus, who hasn't received that Jesus came to die for them, to make peace between you and them, if they're trying to make peace on their own, to live a good enough life, to be holy enough, to be just enough, to be righteous enough, that today they would find the peace that comes from stopping, striving, and they would rest in the completed work of Jesus on the cross because it's the only place where peace is found between us and you. Thank you that you make that available to anyone who will trust in Christ for their peace, that today if someone would say, yes, I wanna believe, I, I wanna have peace through Jesus with you, Father, that you make that real. Father, thank you that you give us a peace that drives out fear. Lord, there are some in our midst today who are struggling against things that bring fear up to them. Fear rises as a reasonable response. But it's even more reasonable to be at peace when we realize that the Savior of the world, the one who speaks in the stars and the galaxies and the universe comes into existence is in the boat with us, and he's our friend, and he loves us. And in the midst of the uncertainty of the circumstances we find ourselves in, Father, that you have promised a certainty that there is coming a day, even if that day is not tomorrow or the next day or the day after that, there is a coming a day for all who know and love you in which all things will be made right, justice will be done, tears will be wiped away, cancer will be no more. Death will be no more. Financial insecurity will be no more. And we will be in glory in your presence forever and ever until all things are finished, Father. We thank you that uh, we can't even begin to comprehend what it looks like to spend eternity with you. In the best moments that we can imagine, we just get a taste, a glimpse of the goodness of what a new heaven and new earth will bring to us. So Father, we thank you. We thank you that you came and we thank you that you are coming again. Amen. Wow.